Drugs are menacing our society. It's like a five-hour orgasm. Used wisely can produce the greatest ecstasy that man knows. Marijuana has been an enemy of the state since the first federal law was enacted against it in 1937. Since that time, 20 million Americans have been arrested, convicted, and incarcerated for using the most popular drug in the world. Your Honor, in this case, the state waives trial of the defendant, Ralph Wiley. It is convinced that he is hopelessly and incurably insane, a condition caused by the drug marijuana to which he was addicted. The law is only one deterrent, and not that effective. The government relied on something else, education films. This harmless-looking cigarette is cloaked in many innocent disguises. But light the match, inhale the smoke, and it becomes an invitation to your own murder. They had to now control something that was growing all over the United States as a weed. So they relied mostly on words. Uh, because they didn't have many other resources to uh, to devote to it. I think a lot of people have seen Reefer Madness. That's bitter. That's more like it. I know you like that really well. I'll just take a puff. Though marijuana is now a household name, there was a time when it was an obscure drug used only by the fringes of society. That, some argue, is the reason why it was criminalized. Drugs are illegal be because they do cause problems. The ones that are illicit drugs, health problems, um, uh, crime-related problems, violence-related problems. But it's also true that none of the drugs currently uh, illegal became illegal before they were most closely associated with uh, what were commonly regarded as deviant groups. One of the girls was telling me about a new cigarette that peps you up. Oh, you mean reefers? Yes, that's the name of them. Would you like to try one? Sure, why not? I'm supposed to be on the loose. Okay. Marijuana's trip from a weed to America's arch enemy in a $400 billion drug war begins with its chemistry. Smoking pot draws the active ingredient delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, into the lungs and onto the brain. There, it suppresses the neurons, causing a distortion of perception in time, a lack of coordination, and sometimes uncontrollable hilarity. Within four seconds of the first drag, muscles relax, eyes redden, pulse rate quickens, euphoria, heightened sensitivity, or paranoid feelings arise in the user, an experience that dates back to the dawn of time. Herodotus records some of the earliest uses of cannabis by the Scythians, and what they did was they would build a big bonfire in the middle of the camp, and they would heap a bunch of marijuana on top of it, and then they would throw a tent over it, and they would all go under the tent and breathe the smoke. And that way they consumed it. Next to opium, marijuana is one of the planet's oldest medicines. Ancient Chinese herbalists applied it to stomach pain, menstrual cramps, malaria, and consumption. According to Indian mythology, Shiva, the Hindu goddess of creation and destruction, endowed man with the plant for a joyful pastime. An apt legacy for the drug of the generation that preached free love, challenged authority, and was out to change the world. Cannabis grows anywhere but the Arctic Circle. The earliest record of its use begins in ancient China and India. From the east, cannabis migrated to the rest of the world. Arab traders brought it from the Ganges Valley to North Africa and Spain. From Spain, the conquistadors carried it to the Americas. It was a prized source of fiber for rope and canvas, essential ingredients for ships. In fact, the word canvas comes from the Latin cannabis. 
but it was another conqueror who introduced the plant to Europe. 1804, Napoleon Bonaparte triumphs in Egypt. During the conquest, his army is introduced to an intoxicant unseen in Europe. Unlike in France, where intoxicants are drunk, this one is smoked. The soldiers fancy cannabis over brandy because it doesn't cause hangovers and carry it back to France as a spoil of war. In Paris, it finds favor with the Bohemian set, with artists, authors, students, and prostitutes. The poet Baudelaire writes under its spell. One must be forever drunken if you would not feel the horrible burden of time that bruises your shoulders and bends you to the earth. You must be drunken without cease, with wine, with poetry, with what you please. Be drunken without end. From Paris, it travels to London as a smoking substance and an extract in medicine. Ladies of high society eat hashish confections to lower fevers, ease stomach pains, or any ache at all. Even a queen finds a use for the drug. Queen Victoria used it for menstrual cramps. Um, it was used for insomnia, for, especially for tuberculosis patients who had lost their appetites. Um, it was also used recreationally. The drug's next stop is New York, where cannabis and hashish become one of the many ingredients in America's unregulated patent medicine industry. The writer Fritz Hugh Ludlow uses it as a recreational intoxicant after first taking it for a toothache. With continued use, Ludlow becomes addicted. He writes about his experience in Diary of a Hashish Eater in 1857. When I shut my eyes, I dwelt in a delicious land of dreams. On the wings of a speechless music, I floated through the air, and in the cloud valleys played hide-and-seek with meteors. Sometimes these accounts magnified and glamorized the drug experience and encouraged many people to follow suit. Interestingly enough, Fitzhugh Ludlow became one of the most ardent and earliest supporters of drug regulation through law in the 19th century, writing quite a few stories for Harper's and for various popular magazines on, on drug addiction in the United States, trying to bring awareness to it. Congratulations, now you'll start living. <laughs> That's because your troubles are all gone. Try another puff. In the 19th century, marijuana was far from the recreational drug of a future time. By and large, its only use comes from patent medicines. Americans know little of smoking it as an intoxicant, a custom widespread in the East. That is, until Abdul Hamid II, Sultan of Turkey, makes a very special birthday gift to the American people. 1876. A world's exposition is held in Philadelphia to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. On display are the wonders of the modern world, among them the telephone and the personal printing press, otherwise known as the typewriter. The industrial age has arrived. At the Turkish pavilion, the Sultan Abdul Hamid II makes a gift of a rare and exotic treat. The crown is introduced to smoking marijuana in what may have been the first pot party in the United States, and perhaps the biggest, until Woodstock 93 years later. The Sultan's gift ignites a wave of Yankee ingenuity. Seeing dollar signs in another idle pleasure, entrepreneurs open Turkish smoking parlors in the north. Sometimes people would go to these places in great secrecy, sort of as a lark, and they'd be society matrons as well as prominent businessmen, and they would either smoke hashish or eat hashish-laced confections. At a time when the temperance movement is trying to ban alcohol and close saloons, smoking parlors could have been the alternative way to get high. But the parlors close. Liquor, not cannabis, continues to be the country's drug of choice until a constitutional amendment bans booze and America rediscovers marijuana. New Orleans, 1920. 
America's second largest port is America's number one party city.